I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. My topic is equanimity. And as a bit of introduction to that topic, uh, as a little experiment, I'm going to see if I can maintain some equanimity, and you can as well, with me leaving my windows open uh, to the outside because for various reasons, in part related to my wife and I um, uh, dealing with a lot of mold in our home right now and tearing things apart, blah, blah, I'm leaving the windows open. And you may hear a little background noise. I don't know how the microphone will handle it. Maybe you can let me know what you're hearing. Birds, traffic, neighbors. We'll just try to include that. And a mind-like sky, mind-like a tranquil mountain pond, mind-like the earth. Okay, hopefully it's okay. So equanimity. Uh, equanimity is number seven. So it's kind of, you know, arguably something that we're really moving toward through the factors of awakening, one way of understanding them. Uh, the list traditionally of seven goes mindfulness, investigation, effort or energy, uh, bliss, rapture, joy, tranquility, samadhi, non-ordinary states of consciousness or deep absorption, deep mental training purification of the mind, and number seven, equanimity. So equanimity seems pretty good right there. What is it? Also, in the so-called Brahma Viharas, a Vihara is a dwelling place. Brahma in the traditional North, you know, Indian culture of the Buddhist day, it's a representation of just the highest attributes, the divine abodes, uh, avail with qualities available to, to us here and now down here on planet Earth. Um, the four Brahma Viharas, or immeasurables, as they're described sometimes in Tibetan Buddhism, are uh, compassion, kindness, um, kind of a happiness about the welfare of others, uh, delighting in their good news, and equanimity. And it is said that equanimity is the uh, fulfillment, really, uh, of compassion, kindness, and altruistic joy. Uh, you can see the quotation that I put in um, and uh, in from Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, if you just joined us, I'll, I'll put it in again right here. The way it works in chat and Zoom is if you just join the chat, you can only see what's happened in the chat after you joined. Um, he makes the point that in the you know the four heavenly abodes, the Brahma Viharas, um, you know the fulfillment of compassion, kindness, and altruistic joy is equanimity. Oh, okay, another pretty good, right? Also, in right concentration, that element of the eightfold path, uh, we have the four jhanas. And um, I've talked about them before when I was uh, last week when I was talking about samadhi and concentration. And in the third and fourth jhanas, as there's a progression through them, uh, the quality of equanimity really becomes what one is increasingly absorbed in, just really in an equanimous state of being. So equanimity clearly, certainly in the Buddhist tradition, is a, is a valuable thing. Uh, and how do we understand it? How do we understand it, including how do we understand equanimity in a world in which there is pain, there is pleasure, there are relationships and people we love and are attached to, there are um, passions for uh, actualizing our own capacities and delighting uh, with others in the joys of life. Um, there are also moral commitments, including sometimes fiery ones in which we react to injustice and the suffering of others. How do we, how do we relate to equanimity in all of that? To be clear, uh, there's this really quite useful I, notion developed in the Abhidhamma, you know, um, some many centuries after the Buddha passed away, a 
collection of early, relatively early Buddhist teachings, this idea of the far enemy and the near enemy of something. The far enemy of equanimity is agitation, being hijacked, being disturbed, being enraged, being addicted, right? Um, that's, that's, that's very much different from equanimity, and it's hard for the two to, to coexist with each other. The near enemy is something that kind of sort of looks like uh, a, a beneficial trait a, or state uh, to have, but is actually not the same. And then the near enemy of equanimity is apathy, indifference. Just don't give a darn. Callousness. <clears throat> so it's clear that we can be equanimous while also uh, resting in compassion, kindness, and, and joy for others, as, as well as moral commitments. So how do we do that, right? How do we do that? This is where the first and the second noble truths, which I think are the real fulcrum of practice, <clears throat> are really useful. The first noble truth in the Buddhist tradition, uh, in the language of uh, the primary language or a primary language of early Buddhism, Pali, P-A-L-I, the first noble truth is that there is tanha, pardon me, there is dukkha, dukkha. D-U-K-K-H-A. There is dukkha. Dukkha is not suffering. Dukkha is not well translated because in part it has three qualities to it that no single English word, certainly, perhaps in another language maybe, but no single word in English encompasses these three qualities. So life contains dukkha. It's not all that it contains. But certainly, a large part of life involves dukkha. What is dukkha? Three attributes. One, unpleasant experiences. There are unpleasant experiences of all kinds, physical and social and emotional. Second, all pleasant experiences come to an end eventually, one way or another including eventually in our own bodily passing. And the third attribute of dukkha is that uh, all experiences, and you could by argue by extension, all material phenomena, in other words, all thoughts and things, broadly stated, have uh, are inherently uh, processual. In other words, they are inherently comprised of processes that are connected and changing. And, and therefore, there's an inherent instability, even insubstantiality, and in certainly the streaming of consciousness, which makes it impossible to grasp experiences, contain and control and, and possess them and keep them to ourselves. My precious. That's dukkha. Now, notice that dukkha is not inherently suffering. Um, there are unpleasant experiences. And we suffer in the ways we relate to them. There, the um, uh, pleasant experiences end. Okay, uh, most many unpleasant experiences end too, as well. And one pleasant experience can be followed by another pleasant experience. So if we're not attached to the pleasant experiences, we're having no suffering there either. And the fact that everything is made of, of processes that are connected and changing, including our bodies and including our our very apparent selves themselves. That's not an inherent problem. Then we come to tanha, T-A-N-H-A. That's the second noble truth. And for me, this is the crux of um, the Buddha Dharma. And the Buddha's highlighting of the relationship between dukkha and tanha is for me whew, the common sense, foundational, undeniable experience near, not metaphysical not philosophical, um, brilliant, uh, useful, <laughs> you know, heart of the Dharma. Tanha is typically translated as craving, which is not a terrible word. Uh, it kind of implies that all tanha is like, you know, you're, you're drowning and you're craving a breath or you're, you're an addict and you're, you're craving your, your shot of heroin or something. Um, tanha shows up in many, many subtle ways. Uh, 
One of the hallmarks of tanha is a sense of contraction or pressure, insistence, or being driven around something, being carried away by fear or anger. Um, things have to change, needing something to happen, tanha. To really summarize a lot in a two formulas. Dukkha plus tanha equals suffering. When tanha is added to the inherent dukkha of living, that's when suffering begins. Dukkha without tanha equals peace. Or we could say, given our topic this, this evening, dukkha without tanha equals equanimity. Now, in our mind, which is sort of like a mosaic, or to use another metaphor that rings true for me, like the surface of a, of a glass of soda water, fizzing water, with all the little bubbles popping up, being one thought or another, one reaction, emotion, image, desire, of an, after another, pop, 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 and kind of intertwining with each other. There may well be some bubbles popping in the surface of your stream of consciousness in the moment that are far from equanimous. And yet over here, there could be an absence of tanha. There's no craving over here. Over here, you're undisturbed. There's equanimity over there. Tanha is the problem, not dukkha. Dukkha is not a problem. It is simply part of living. So how do we understand tanha? And how do we deal with it and, and grow equanimity in our everyday life? This is absolutely fundamental to freedom from suffering uh, and the liberation, the unshakable liberation, as it says in the Dharma, of the, of the heart. Tanha, craving, drive, drivenness, is fundamentally a biologically grounded process. It is animals that crave. We could argue that in some sense, you know, the plant craves moisture or it craves the light. All right. And we can see immediately there that tanha is natural. And in fact, if we ref just reflect on evolution, uh, uh, Mother Nature evolved tanha because it kept her babies alive. And it kept them focused, <laughs> worried, cranky, aggressive, driven, uh, craving about their young as mammals and primates and hominids and humans in particular evolved. And um, also as particularly humans evolved, uh, some other animal species as well, uh, you know, we have evolved this sense of being a, a unified self that really, really wants things and um, craves being treated really, really well. How dare you look at me that way, right? Do you, do you still like me? Do you still want me? Tanha is natural. It's, it's not aberrant. It's not evil. It's not... Um, It's not bad, it's just tanha. It has consequences though, it has consequences. And we all have experiences uh, in which we're dealing with certain things and something happens, uh, we crave in reference to needs. So if, if suddenly a need seems unmet or challenged, like our need to be liked and somebody's kind of distancing, or um, a, uh, someone I was talking with earlier today for multiple reasons or complexities there, uh, had got some bad news about a business situation, potentially bad news, which besides the financial uh, threat of it, 
you know, tanha is a response to threat, uh, for this person was also a threat to uh, image, a threat to um, being valued by others. It, it was a threat of, in psycholingo, a narcissistic injury. Understandably, <sighs> that sense of contraction, pressure, reactivity, self referential processing, taking it personally, it gets mobilized. Okay, it's understandable. So then the question becomes, how can we gradually, with our developed human brains and thus minds, and our capacities for mindfulness and wisdom and um, self-regulation and the cultivation of various factors of awakening, including factors of equanimity, how can we practice in such a way as to manage the biological blueprint that we're each endowed with and manage it in a way that doesn't fight with that, but gradually finds other ways to meet our needs without adding craving broadly stated, into the mix? This is the great question, isn't it? And I see comments in the chat that have to do with how do we manage our sorrows about uh, the climate crisis? How do we manage our more, you know, our kind of stunned outrage at how people uh, might be reacting, some of them, to recent political events? Uh, how do we manage that, right? How do we pursue our dreams? How does this person I was speaking with pursue their very understandable uh, desires to build a successful business for all kinds of reasons? How to do that without the contractions and pressures of craving? Isn't that the art? Isn't that the art? So I'm seeing a variety of of comments and 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 sharings in the chat that are really speaking to this fundamental question. Fundamental question. So for one, real-time mindfulness of the rising and falling of craving or its you know, adjacent qualities like contraction or tension or pressure insistence on getting the goal, getting the goal, getting the target. Um, Real-time mindfulness of those qualities of craving is incredibly useful. Because more and more what will happen is things will occur and you'll just start, it, you'll observe yourself within half a second, with certainly within two seconds, you'll observe yourself, oh, labeling it as craving. You might choose other words like insistence or pressure, you know, aversion, greed, traditional terms. Just observing it often helps you realize I can accomplish my important goal here without adding craving into the mix. I can be strong. I can keep my heart open. I can say what needs to be said. I can keep going without the qualities of craving being so mixed into it. Even just turning in the turning down the volume, uh, we need to have a craveometer, right? Zero to ten, no eleven. This is not Spinal Tap. Craveometer, and okay, you notice suddenly your needles rising, you know up to a six or a seven, four or five, and then you go, you know, I could bring it down to a two or a one or a 0.3. That is really helpful. Real-time mindfulness of, of craving. Major pathway into greater and greater equanimity. Second, as you may know, there's a lot of teaching in the Buddha Dharma about this gap between the hedonic tone, sometimes called feeling tone, although it doesn't have anything inherently uh, or exclusively to do with emotion, the hedonic tone of pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant. And I would actually add relational as an emerging fourth 
distinct hedonic tone, there's a kind of gap or space of choice. Viktor Frankl also spoke to that space of choice uh, between the hedonic tone of experiences and the craving that can arise in response to that hedonic tone. Uh, in your brain, probably the major you know, region of generating and tracking, or more exactly not generating, but, but tracking hedonic tone is the amygdala. It's what scientists call a salience detector, it, what personal relevance detector. And based on the hedonic tone at the time, this feels good, crave more of it. This feels bad, crave less of it. This feels relational, cling more to it. Based on the hedonic tone of the time, the amygdala and other parts of the brain, but especially the amygdala, initiates a cascade of craving responses to it that move through both hormonal and neural channels. So real-time mindfulness of the hedonic tone is really, really useful. In fact, it's so useful that the Buddha called it out as one of the four establishments of mindfulness. Where do we establish mindfulness? What do we, what do we remain you know, present with continuously? The hedonic tone of experience because it's right after that hedonic tone continuously that we get into trouble, right? This hurts, so you yell at it or run away from it or freeze in shock, right, in response to it. That tastes really good. Oh, give me more of that, right? Uh, I believe there's a Chinese proverb. Um, you take drink, drink takes drink, drink takes you. That slippery slope, right? So getting on top of that slippery slope and, and really getting early in it before you <laughs> You know, you're way down, as I have found myself many times. You know, you know when you're closer to the top of the ridge line, so you could, you know, come down a little, but then eh, get back to the center place of equipoise again. That's a really good thing. All right. Third, really good headline, I think, um, is to explore healthy desire in Pali Chanda. I think it's C-H-A-N-D-H-A -H -H in English, or English letters, um, or not just English letters, <laughs> some letters, C-H-A-N-D-H-A, -H -H -A, Chanda, um, healthy desire. The Buddha acknowledged healthy desire, including the desire for awakening, the desire that others be happy, the, others, the desire that Others in oneself be free of suffering or suffer less. These are healthy desires. The desire to protect our children from harm, uh, to build a world that is, you know, compassionate, just, and prosperous and peaceful for all. That's a healthy desire. Right? Uh, you know, there you are playing tic tac toe, or you know, you're playing tennis, or your favorite sports team is uh, playing basketball. And uh, you might have healthy desires related to that, so be it. So it's really interesting to explore passion for, for enjoyments of various kinds, for, for satisfactions, better word, of various kinds. So explore passion for that without getting uh, contracted or driven or attached to the outcome. It's, it's also really useful to explore, again, healthy desire with regard to our need for safety that is often about, you know, may have fear mixed into it, recognition of threat, maybe some alarm. There might be some arising anger or fieriness or intensity. Um, uh, there might be a sense of injustice mixed in to explore centered, calm in your core or in control in your core responses that are appropriate and are not uh, swept away by anger or terror or fear. Responses that also are not frozen. In other words, in which there's an agility and an agency in you. You're not helpless. You're not immobilized. It's great. 
to really explore that way of being. Your heart might be pounding. You might really have to mobilize to get everybody out of the house or to deal with the situation. But in your core, whoosh, there's a centeredness, there's a calm, there's a stability. That's really useful to explore. Chanda without tanha. Healthy desire without craving. And I really think that um, one of the weak spots of uh, Buddhism, certainly in the West, and to my knowledge, even in traditional uh, Asian um, settings, uh, it's been a, it's been a weakness to explore to fail to explore thoroughly um, chanda without tanha. In other words, to explore healthy desire without getting caught up in craving. I think maybe there's been a kind of tendency in um, monastically centered traditions that are quite ascetic to be afraid. Um, understandably maybe, of the slippery slope of people talking the talk of Chanda without Tana. There you are, that's a banner. We're gonna have you know, a million mellow Buddhas marching down the street, right? People maybe could get caught up in the talk of that, but still, still, uh, we have a brain that's designed to want what it likes. Be, you know, be aware of that. Um, so people might you know, go too far, they might get all carried away with their chanda, their healthy desires, then get into trouble around them. And, uh, you know, I get that concern, but I think for most people who have a genuine interest in contemplative practice, even at a foundational level of simple everyday mindfulness, uh, they're living in the world, they're householders, they have goals, they have bills, they have children, they have, they have sex, Wah! you know, they get goofy with their friends sometimes. They get mad, you know, they get they get put upon. Uh, they're dealing with things. Uh, they get mistreated. They have reactions to that, you know. Uh, and Chanda, could, anything could be a vehicle for spiritual bypassing, as Donna puts out, but not inherently. You know, the Buddha called out many, many wholesome desires. Think about the second element in the normal, the typical list of the Eightfold Path, uh, right intention. That's healthy desire. How about right effort or wise effort? Right livelihood, right speech, right action. It's all about healthy desire. And, you know, living, living in ways in which we have uh, important values, important motivations, and yet, without the corruptions, the hindrances, the defilements, as it is said, of craving. I think a lot of people in the you know, Western Buddhist world, maybe elsewhere, have been, I don't know, bamboozled or afraid of wholesome desire. To manage wholesome desire with a brain that you know, is designed to want what it likes, we really have to be on top of our game. Okay. Be on top of our game as best we can, day to day to day, living in a world in which it's, a, it's necessary and appropriate to, to have and to be skillful with healthy desires of various kinds. Okay. Fourth, and I'm deliberately looking for ways here to deepen an equanimity that maybe are not so commonly talked about. A fourth way to deepen an equanimity is to build up the emotional memory of needs met enough in the present. Build up the emotional memory of needs met enough in the present. Because we crave when it feels like our needs are not met. Okay. Build up. an emotional somatic memory in your body, an underlying sense of needs met enough in the present. So that that becomes like an underlying home base. And when things happen that challenge needs, that home base is already really active in you. Yeah? It's not delusional. It recognizes challenges to needs, to needs. But it also recognizes that we can meet challenges to our needs. We can meet threats 
We can meet frustration and disappointment and obstruction. We can meet conflicts and mistreatment and holy moly, you're willing to do that <laughs> you know, from other people. We can meet that on the basis of an underlying authentic deep down feeling of, of a sufficiency of peacefulness, contentment, and love in the present. And this is a really, really important thing to do. I haven't seen this anywhere in the Buddha Dharma. It's not really talked about, but it's an incredibly useful tool. I've taught about it for a while. You probably recognize what I've say, I'm saying here. I've practiced it myself. When in the present you feel genuinely safe enough right now, already, you know, um, all right right now, slow down and let it land. You know, when you have a sense of calm, strong coping, you're dealing with stuff and you're handling it. You know what that feels like? Let it sink in. Sense of identifying yourself as a calm, competent coper. Calming your core, even if you're kind of rattled around the edges, <laughs> a little revved up there. But in your core, you're getting down the mountain. You're bringing your friends with you, crossing over to safety. You're getting stuff done. You're doing what you can, one foot in front of the other every day. Let it in. When you can feel a kind of enoughness of pleasure in the moment, like gratitude, gladness in the moment, let it in. You know, Same with love and connection. Let it in. This is a fourth profound practice. And then I want to finish on a deep one that's um, also traditionally uh, uh, taught, and uh, it's important for this to move over time from a concept to an experience. And that is, I'll put it in technical, traditional terms, a recognition of the inherent emptiness of all phenomena, all thoughts and things. What does that mean? It is not that they are non-existent. That's a critical error that's sometimes made in the languaging of the Dharma. They're not that they're non-existent. It's that they're like a dream in that all phenomena, all thoughts and things are right here. We have the third attribute of dukkha. They are inherently made of processes that are connected and changing and thus empty of absolute self-existence including the apparent I that seems so independent, unified, and enduring, not. As we recognize increasingly the ways in which all our experiences are just kind of fizzing, foaming, foggy, <laughs> cloud-like, dream-like, changing, swirling, you can't grab anything. The, you try to, you know, they, they swirl together. There's like one fabric, one tissue, one reality, more and more. You know, as, as that happens, two things occur. As your vipassana, your insight into emptiness deepens, two things happen for you. And you can mark this process for yourself and you can encourage it in yourself, and you can see it happening, you can share it with others. Um, as you recognize that the experience of a particular pleasure is empty in this technical sense, it's, it's, it's cloud-like rather than brick-like. Um, as you recognize that this particular pleasure is empty, this experience, the inclination to cling to it or possess it or identify with it or own it as mine, starts fading away because increasingly it's, it's undone at its base. <laughs> you know, how do you cling to air? You know, it's like, uh, and as you recognize that pains also have the attribute of emptiness, they become more bearable. It still hurts, but it becomes somehow more bearable. As you see that this pain is a local expression of a vast network of intertwining phenomena that are in, you know, have a 
mainly, if not entirely, impersonal quality to them. Right? So our reactivity, whether it's through grasping or aversion to our experiences and, and, out, and outer phenomena as well, starts to fade uh, into equanimity as the insight into emptiness grows. It's fundamental dharma, fundamental teaching, profound teaching, really developed particularly in the Mahayana expressions of Buddhism. The other thing that also is developed really fully in the Mahayana expressions of Buddhism, you know, emerging many centuries after the Buddha uh, walk, walked this earth, um, is that as we deepen our insight into emptiness, we deepen our sense of allness, interdependence, the edges start softening between self and world, self and other, self and reality. And more and more, we experience that sense of interdependence and oneness. And as the sense of oneness grows, increasingly there's no problem to solve. There are things to do. There is healthy desire. There are issues to, con to deal with. But it's in a frame increasingly of, I am the problem. I am the solution. The eye starts to fade. As the sense of self fades, uh, equanimity grows. Because increasingly there's, there's nothing to contend with. There's no one who is contending with. It's simply all one thing. And you find this expressed uh, eloquently in classic non-dual self-transcendent experiences such as my friend Henry Schuckman and others have experienced and talk about in which the contracted, separated sense of self drops out and the sense of oneness with all is just radiantly the case, profoundly equanimous, any sense of disturbance or upset with the way it is, including uh, with a body that may be in pain or dealing with a terminal illness, uh, just it's not that it's not it's not that there's no grief there it's not that there's no anxiety there but they they too have a part in the allness of it, of everything this is obviously more and more to be experienced rather than simply understood i'm on that journey myself uh, but i think naming these things and not patronizing people uh, you know, as a teacher, is really important. This is hardcore, liberating stuff, not in Kansas any longer, and yet it's the calling to us. As the Buddha taught, this is a path that's good in the beginning, the middle, and the end, and people farther along the path are calling to us to join them, including in these deepening, deepening kinds of ways. So, that's my presentation on, on equanimity. Uh, I did the best I could, which is a factor of equanimity. And I want to now respond to questions. Perhaps somebody has something to, um, to say, perhaps would like to speak with me. I just you know, want to just kind of remind you, an understandable uh, question is along the lines of how can I have equanimity when I know that so many people are suffering? And there are many responses. We need to find our own. A classic and to me wise response is we can have both compassion and equanimity. Uh, the equanimity that is the fruit of great wisdom, uh, the jewel and the lotus. And in the history of Buddhism, which is the jewel and which is the lotus has actually metaphorically uh, changed over time. So I think it's kind of cool to think uh, that, you know, we could say that the, you know, the lotus is love and the fruit of love is the jewel of wisdom. Or we could go the other way and say the lotus is wisdom, the fruit of which is the jewel of love. Either way, the two together.
Both and, both and, not either or. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, great, I think, so briefly, Elizabeth's com question comment, tw 24 minutes past the hour. Um, so dopamine is a major uh, fuel for uh, tanha, for craving. Uh, dopamine uh, tracks reward. Uh, it's not as involved in the experience of pleasure and, and, and healthy pleasures such as love. Uh, as are the natural opioids, oxytocin, and other things. But dopamine is involved a little bit. But it's 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 involved in kind of tracking reward rising and also tracking rewards, expected rewards falling. So um, it's very much involved in that engine of craving. People in the spirited, you know, attention, uh, dis distractible, impulsive, stimulation seeking, you know end of the spectrum. I don't think of it as a disorder, so I'm kind of being careful in how I talk about it. Definitely often have a limited expression of receptors for dopamine, um, and so they really benefit from constant trickles of uh, stimuli, reward, novelty, you know, uh, because it's when dopamine levels drop in other words, when the expectation of reward drops, that's when we tend to get driven, uh, particularly in terms of um, goal-seeking, grasping of different kinds. So paradoxically, this goes to a deep point, it is in part through the healthy satisfaction, the healthy fulfillment, chanda, through the healthy fulfillment of our needs while registering the experience authentically of that healthy fulfillment, moment after moment after moment, that we withdraw fuel from the biological engines of craving. Isn't that interesting and profound? And you can see that what I'm saying here, which is grounded in Dharma 101, you know, the movement, how do we deal with dukkha without tanha, first and second noble truths, and also grounded in total biology, um, it's really curious to me that there's been this almost anathema in the 2,500 year old history of, of the Dharma to kind of, there's, there's, it's just been left out, if not dismissed, uh, including in erroneous translations of dukkha as suffering, that um, we've, there's been a kind of swerving away from the healthy fulfillment of needs enough in the present while internalizing the experience of that as a major, major undoing of the machinery of craving and a major bulwark increasingly internalized inside and woven into your body in emotional memory and other systems in your body. It's a bulwark against, you know, getting hooked yet again, you know, uh, by those trains of craving, as I talked about in the meditation, just trying to carry us away. Really useful to internalize a sense of needs met enough in the moment. All right. So I can see that we've got a couple minutes to go. Uh, probably not time to talk with someone here. I'm going to take a quick peek at, um, yeah. Ah, great. Very sweet comments coming in here, really coming in. Great. OK. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll turn to the poet. Uh, poets, plural. Uh, first of all, I, obviously the very well known, for good reason, um, uh, lines from Mary Oliver. Tell me, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? I may have garbled a word or two there, but what do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. We cannot live without valuing at the molecular level, at the cellular level, uh, plants, microbes, complex, mar complex organisms, lizards, mouse and mon mice and monkeys. We can't live, we must value. So how do we value well? Can we value through chanda? 
on a foundation of equanimity, on a ground in a ground of equanimity, in a space, a field, a frame of equanimity, can we can we value through chanda? Or uh, are we going to uh, value things, lean toward goals, pursue various aims on the basis of craving? It's, it's either the one or the other. As long as we live, there is our needs, our, our valuings, including biologically. How do we do it? And the great blessing of the factors of awakening and including uh, the last in the list, equanimity, is to enable us <laughs> with our monkey, rat, and lizard, and you know, <laughs> crab, <laughs> worm, <laughs> minds, and brains. How do we live in this world with those qualities and with honestly the the learnings in a sense of trauma? And pain and loss and difficulty that the the, the the learnings of which often are to in, intensify and to kind of bake in patterns of craving. How do we gradually do that? And there's a lot of hows there. I'll finish here, but certainly these seven qualities, factors, uh, states of experience in the moment, and traits that we cultivate over time of mindfulness, investigation. Um, effort, um, bliss, uh, positive emotion, tranquility, uh, concentration, absorption, meditative training, samadhi, and then last equanimity. Equanimity. We can cultivate these in our lives, and as we do, it's such an enjoyable path along the way, and it bears such great fruit over time. So may your own path be a blessing for you and also for others. And may you practice equanimity with the sounds of other people you may hear through my window. So take good care.